Welcome to another episode of Moments That Could Have Changed Football Forever. I'm Peter Thornton. I'm with my fellow author, Peter Prickett. Hi, everyone. And our special guest today, and we're really excited about this, we have the chief sports writer of the Eye, Mr. Kevin Garside, with us today. Good evening, all. Uh, and Kevin, you've chosen a brilliant uh, first what if um, from that is contained in the book, but what if the Munich air crash hadn't happened? Um, and just following on from that, what Ferrant podcast had signed for United? But how did you first hear about the babes? Because like me, you just sort of passed it when it happened. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, retrospectively, obviously, as a, as a United fan, the um, the babe, when you first go to Old Trafford and you see the, the plaque on the wall and all that, 58, you begin to uh, piece the stuff together. Um, yeah, so I think my first game at United was about 73, I think FA Cup, 73, Southampton it was. I can't remember what round now, but I remember seeing uh, George in the flesh score a goal, um, put two fingers up to the director's box. Um, I think... Uh, <laughs> Charlton was in, in the team. I think Dennis Law might have played. Um, can't remember much about it other than George being brilliant. And I think Southampton scored first that night. So, yeah, so you kind of piece the Munich stuff retrospectively, don't you? Um, and understanding in the end just how significant that was for so many reasons. I mean, I know we've passed the, the anniversary this month. But, um, yeah, the, you know, the... The, the whole story. I mean, Bobby's Bobby's funeral um, at the end of last year, which I attended, yeah. that brought it all back uh, for lots of lots of attendees, lots of people, some some um, uh, some still living members, family members of, of those who were in the plane who died, um, but attended the funeral, um, and it was very moving. And yeah, it's amazing what that period meant to, to Manchester, and, and it defined, you know, it defined defined Manchester United, didn't it? The um, the disaster. Yeah, it did. I mean, in, in the book, we sort of touch on the fact that, oh, you know, we, we think that if the crash hadn't have happened, it wouldn't have been Bobby Moore that picked up the World Cup. It would have been Duncan Edwards without, you know, a shadow of a doubt. He'd have been the captain of the, of the England team. Huge. But for this podcast, we, we sort of looking at more of the effect it would have had on, on United and the challenge they were making to Real Madrid at the time. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it goes without saying, you know, I mean, you mentioned Bobby Moore were not picking it up. He might have picked it up in 62, you know. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Edwards is 21. He would have been he would have been 25 at his peak in 62. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I, I, I made this point and, you know, you can't. You know, I mean, the whole point of the book is, you, you know, rewriting history. In that sense. Yeah, but the, the impact, you know, the impact. I mean, they, they were coming back to Manchester after a victory, weren't they, you know. People, uh, I remember going to Manchester. Uh, I remember going to for leaving Manchester for the first time in '83. Um, not for the first time, but um, to leave home, as it were, um, and came to London as a student. And, I, and my best mate at the time, chap called Mark Forsyth, who lived in St Peter Street in Islington, and his old man was a season ticket holder at Arsenal, and he just used to love the United legend. Um, and at the time, it was Gordon Strachan and, and Jesper Olsen, and he couldn't say them. He, he used to call him Gordon Strackland and, and Jesper Olsen. <laughs> Bless him. Um, proper, authentic Cockney, a grocer. Uh, but he spoke about, you know, the, the last game that the Babes played uh, in England was, was the Ivory. Yeah, yeah. Ivory. Um, and that's the last we saw of them. Um, but can you was imagine? That five, four? It's a mad score, I think, wasn't it? It was 5-4. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think it was 5-4, yeah. Um, but Edwards was massive in that, of course. Bobby was a baby, wasn't he? Um, and, and Edwards, this colossus, you know, 21 years old, just a man, a man mountain. Um, and United were going, were, 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 were um, doing brilliantly in this kind of pioneering role. No one, no, the, the, the Football League at the time didn't want um, participation. It was political, but they didn't want the partic participation of English clubs in Europe. But United were ploughing on. Wolverhampton Wanderers, of course, were doing the same. And if, if, you can, I mean, it's it's beyond doubt, isn't it? Really, with a talent, a, a squad of that that talent led by someone like like um, like Edwards, it would have punched a massive hole in the whole Real Madrid edifice. Because at yeah. Real Madrid, Real Madrid grew their brand out of being the European champions. The fact that there was a it was kind of a minor, not a minor tournament. It was in its infancy, so there weren't many teams. It wasn't anywhere near like the scale that we had now. Yeah. 
Um, and you were beating inferior teams in the most part. So, you know, um, you, you know, you could... It, I, I think the feeling to... what, what it, the, the United were getting closer. It, it, what you've just said is exactly true. The FA didn't want a minute to start with, yeah. but they, they persisted. And then, it, like anything, even though you say the standard, certainly in the early rounds, weren't as, as big as it is now. But they were getting closer and closer, weren't they? The games were getting tighter against Madrid. Well, it wasn't so much that the standard wasn't great. You, just didn't, have, you didn't have to have 50 matches to get to the final. You know, you didn't yeah. have a, a league, you know, a league programme and then going into the knockout stage. You know, it was, it was more straightforward. And uh, but it was hard because the travel and everything else. But there's no doubt that that, that United team, um, replete as it was with so many gifted individuals, had already demonstrated its strength and its power. And would have would have got Madrid, I think, would have caught up with Madrid. Yeah. In that period, and and you could it, it wouldn't it's not it's not um, ridiculous to argue that they could have won it once or maybe twice that 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 the, the babes in that period. I think um, that's what we got for Pete in it in the finish. They win it a couple of times, I think. A couple of times. The season prior to the air disaster, um, Real Madrid. And Manchester United face each other in the semi-final. Yeah, and it's close. It's six-three, yeah. but Madrid have a three-one win in the first leg. Yeah, and it's it's level in the second leg. Yeah. But we have to bear in mind that it's, it's an even younger United the year before. Yeah, yeah. so they're on their upward trend, yeah. and Real Madrid are already. A team with very experienced players, so there are p potentially on opposite trajectories. They're a more, a more evolved team, aren't they? They're an experienced team. Yeah, um, and yeah. They, Real Madrid. Uh, I think they recognised they are in need of of, a, of an addition, and the season after they go and sign the best goal scorer in European football in Pushkush. Yeah. Um, but yeah, undoubtedly, you would assume, which everyone does, the talent is only going to get better, and it's, yeah. and they're going to be even closer. So maybe, yeah, Real Madrid did win those first two, but what happens to the next three? Yeah, exactly that, exactly that. And you know, I say it's not an insane argument to to claim that United would have been bang in the mix there, um, and then that changes everything. You know, um, it's not as if, I mean it. It's not as if you know United. Looking back from this position now, are in, they're in need of something, but it's not identity, is it? So, um, <laughs> um, um, well, that's true. Yeah. I, I think I think it's absolutely true for the competition itself. In as much as if you don't get Real Madrid, Real Madrid, Real Madrid, Real Madrid, Real Madrid, and you do get Real Madrid, Real Madrid, Manchester United, <laughs> yeah, Real yeah, Madrid, yeah. Manchester United, Wool, yeah. or whatever, yeah. it isn't that kick off for Real Madrid as the brand, is it? You know, no, we, are, we are the European Cup type. Yeah, and, and United, I think. But it made United a world brand in a way that, you know, that, that, yeah. that you wouldn't have wanted to do it that way, but it made them a, a world brand. Um, well, it, it, it made them everybody's favourite second team, didn't it? Well, yeah. and yeah, Or first team, if you go, you know, if you wander around London, you know, these days. Uh, <laughs> that's the, you know, no one comes from Manchester, do they? Because they all support you all up. <laughs> <laughs> except, except you're in our slot now, aren't you? You're in the United slot now. Where oh, you get, where, you've got a matches. City, you know, yeah, just, yeah. just an aside, breaking off. But you know, you go, when I go to the Etihad now, I, I, it's just a remarkable juxtaposition of the kind of the blokes our age who who, who watch City. You know, when Gota was the goat, um, and you know, who remember what it was like to play um, in, in the playoff against Gillingham, was it in '99? Yep. Yeah. Um, and they have a different feeling of, you know, the old Kip Axe Brigade and, and what, it, you know, the old underdog experience. And this, I, I swear, I, in my in my impression of it is that they still don't really know how, how what to make of all this. <laughs> you know, this, this pet no, no, it's a really it's a really good point. Uh, and we've talked long, not just about the city, but we, we, me and Pete have talked long and hard about this, about the, the current fan, because... I was saying, if you are, if you go to City and you are a teenager, a late teenager, you probably you probably weren't there for the Aguero moment. No, no. You know, if, you're, if you're 17, 18, you you were like five or six. You probably yeah. weren't at the game. You weren't there. You know, which for us is like mad. Yeah. But you know, because we not we, only we, for you, mate. <laughs> yeah. But but you know, because me and Peter, as you know, we're both heavily into coaching. We've talked about like probably the only move that is still 
registered as with that player is the Cruyff turn. Just something that stood the test of time. If you try and coach like what I used to call the Chrissy Waddle, the kids have no idea who Chris Waddle is. No, None no, whatsoever. No. Who's he? No. You know. And and I think, mm. you know, just to bring it back, I think Ferran Puskas suffers as much as anyone from from uh, if you look at his goal scoring record, it is unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it just is. And we don't have enough footage, do we, of, of these great yep. players? I would love to know more about Hijiguti from that team, the 50s, yes. the 58 Golden team that didn't win the World Cup, by the way. Um, love to know more about Di Stefano. I mean, I've seen snippets of him. He looks like Bobby Charlton on acid. You know what I mean? He looks, yes. looks like an even better Bobby. A bit of George Best thrown in, but, you know, he dropped that shoulder and fly past people. Um, yeah, love to. Um, Tom Finney, I'd love to know what Tom Finney looked like on the pitch. Yeah. Um, it, it's um, really interesting because the you know the research we did for the book and the research I did on the National Football Museum. One of the things that I noticed, especially with Tom and with Duncan Edwards, it isn't just their present on the pitch; it's the reaction to the other twenty-one players on it to them. Yeah. That's how you can tell how great they were. The Roy Keane, Roy Keane effect, the Vieira, Patrick Vieira effect. It's, yes, uh, it's how they get others. What they get, what what they drag out of others, you know. Roy wasn't the best player at United by any stretch, um, but man, he got he got five percent more out of everybody else, and that made United yeah. unbeatable. And they were, I mean, United weren't winning like City, you know. They weren't clocking hundred points, ninety points. They were just edging it with 75, 84. Yeah. Um, and, and and we needed players to make the difference, and and it was players like King. Canton. Well, I think I think it's one of the things that drives me drives me mad about modern football, but. City in particular, where the, you know the captaincy gets passed around, I'm not for that. You know, you've just cited Roy. Yeah, Roy's your captain. He gets five percent out of everyone. That's yeah, your captain, yeah. isn't it? That's what he's there for. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, although you know, it's not. I think you know, the captain in football is less less of a feature. I mean, it's ninety minutes, isn't it? You know, and there's no there's no kind of um um there's no diplomatic role for the. Club captain, uh, in, in a sense, not like cricket, is it? You know, where you're England captain you, and you're an ambassador yeah. for England, aren't you? You know, uh, yes. football, you're just like um, you're out there for 90 minutes with your sleeves rolled up, aren't you? And it's, it's uh, a far, and everybody's less, in. far less strategic role as well, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, oh, oh, cricket, you, you live and die by your captain. Yeah, well, because yeah, Ben, I mean, if, if Ben Stokes, if he's not Roy Keane, I don't know who is, you know. Yeah, um, we were talking about this the other day, you know, who's the, who's the greatest living? British or a sportsman, uh, English, if you like, to English. Who is it? Who's better than Who's better than Ben Stokes at the minute? McElroy, maybe. Lewis Hamilton, um, footballer. Uh, yeah, he's very we cute. Just, carry the lot like Ben does, is he? Yeah, we're drifting off off subjects a little bit, but um, yeah, it was just uh, I, I mean, being just come back from India, it was um, it was kind of a parlour game we played out there. Um, well, great greatest living until not that long ago was. Possibly Bobby Charlton. Well, I think probably greatest ever because of, again, you know, I, I, I wrote a piece. I mean, he died, didn't he, on a Saturday, mm. which which fell into the remit of the Sunday newspapers. And, of course, you've got Bobby Charlton. All the great newspapers in, in, in this land have got their obits already stretched out. They've, they've had it written for 10 years. And it goes in the paper on Sunday. So if you don't publish on a Sunday, which we don't, we only publish Monday to Saturday, then you've got to do approach it a little bit differently. Um, but the, you know, the, the, there was some brilliant writing about Bobby mm. on that in those Sunday newspapers. Um, but the thing that that struck me about that, that more, as much as anything is just that you know he was kind of he, he wasn't just an English footballer; he was England. <laughs> he was England yeah. to so many people. Yeah. Um, well, you know, although I'm a City fan, that's how I fell in love with football. He was, you know, it was Bobby Charlton. You know, I was nine was. when we won the World Cup. You're you were reluctant know, City fan. I know you, you you want to be a United fan, but you won't allow yourself. So you've just stuck with this kind of city. <laughs> my, dad, my dad was a probably you yeah. watched Old Trafford from our house in Salford, but my dad liked the pub and the pub liked my dad. So I yeah. think <laughs> Can you imagine coming from a, a household? My father, the only thing he liked on, on sport was the ITV7. You know, I mean, he didn't give a yeah. monkey to about football. And he used to goad me the whole time saying, Eee, that Liverpool are a good team, aren't they? They're, they're a good team, that <laughs> Liverpool. And I've been going mad, you know, because of course they were a good team when I was a boy, and they still are, aren't they? Amazing, amazing. Just, just to let you know, Pete's a Liverpool fan. Are you, Pete? I am indeed. Well, look forward to the look forward to the next ten years, mate, because you know I've just lived through them. 
It's not great. You think you're going to get, you think you're going to get the chosen one. You th and Alonso will come in, and everybody will be clapping him in, and then ten games in, it yamp on a match, and you'd be crisis, you know. And then it'll just um, dribble on. I'm, I'm happy to enjoy the next ten weeks. <laughs> oh, mate. I, I mean, in my view, um, again, we're, we're drifting a little bit from from the, the core um, story here, but I think Klopp's coaching in the presence of Pep Guardiola lifting Liverpool from a position... I thought Liverpool were going to suffer the same fate as Everton, another great institution that were kind of... just were never coming back. Um, and that was the... You know, under, under Gillette and... Um, who was the other fellow with Gillette? Hicks. Hicks. Under Hicks and Gillette, you know, they were comedy comedy goal, weren't they? Like the, Just like United are now, I suppose. Yeah. In the Blazers. But a doomed institution. Um, and a, a Roy... Bless him, Roy Hodgson. You know, just a just a just a succession of poor choices. Um, not that Roy was ever a bad choice, but he also wasn't the right choice. But I just thought they're never coming back. And Klopp, I mean, not just catching City, but just I mean, the, when he when he whacked City, when City, I think when Liverpool won the league, City scored eighty four points, a brilliant total in in Fergie time, but in in the sense of the, in the story that Pepper's written. 84 is appalling, you know, it's a failure. But I mean, they were just smashed that year by Liverpool. And I and I just think that is the greatest, probably one of the greatest achievements in of management in in um in certainly the modern era, but you know, um because because you know when 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 Busby was doing this and you had Jock Steen in Celtic, you had Shankly at Liverpool, you had Joe Mercer at City, you had Bertie Bill, Bertie Me at Arsenal, Phil Nick at Spurs. Um, Bill Nick, I should say. Um, clubs clubs generated their own revenues of 50, 60,000 gates, and they're all in the same pot, weren't they? They're all, they're all more or less the same. But, yeah. I mean, you know, but, but the, the, the arrival of, of the state backed institution just took City just to into a different dimension. Then you had Chelsea with Abramovich, so you had the oligarch, and Liverpool are coming in just still <laughs> like it was 30 years ago. Yeah, they got any extra dough, but they got Klopp and they uh, and Moneyball and all this stuff. and um, just fashioned a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant response to the City Chelsea dynamic, and I think I don't know that we've seen anything better than that. And uh, and what I loved about them is that when they came to the Etihad with City in their pomp with company and yaya yeah, and all this, they actually gave it a go. You know, they actually came at you with Sane and Salah and had a go at City. I mean, company. I think was it the game that company scored that great goal? Can't remember. But I mean, Sane scored, didn't he, to equalise? Yeah, that was the. That, that was the probably one of the best games of football I've seen. That yeah. One. City, that I think yeah. Liverpool equalise and City go ahead and David Silva. Yeah. I mean, the, um, David Silva's probably one of the great players we've ever seen in the Premier League. Yep. Liverpool lost good. on that occasion, but they served notice. This is how you put City under pressure. And they did. I've said, uh, I've said it many times, I've said it on this podcast, I've said it elsewhere, I was just astonished that Klopp came. Not, and uh, timing is everything in life and in football, and it happened to be just the right moment. He'd had his sabbatical. Brendan Rodgers was doing disappointing. Okay. He, was doing, okay, he, he did brilliantly the season before, yeah. but things just weren't clicking That's that second it. season. Yeah. 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 Well, Sterling, Sturridge, Suarez and Skirtle yeah. <laughs> were the yeah. goal threats. Um, yeah. But it was a bit of a it was a bit of a struggle, and I think it's one of them. Klopp was available, so Liverpool pulled the trigger, and they managed to get him. Um, and he would have been a tremendous appointment for any club in the world. Yeah, can't believe he, can't believe he walked past Old Trafford to get to Liverpool. I can't believe it. Well, one of one of the interesting what ifs that we've still got up yeah. our sleeve is the if, if Gerard doesn't slip. And Brendan gets another season. Does does Jurgen finish up at Old Trafford? I mean that slip. Yeah. I mean Deba Bar still had to score, didn't he? But hell of a hell of a goal. But you know what was you know what tickles me now when you look back. I mean, the, the, one of the one of the um, one of the um, let, let's say features of 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 the growth of football is the and the immediacy of the coverage now with social media is how quick we are to, to pass judgment. And I remember. Um, Cara, um, Jamie Carragher and, and, and Jamie Redknapp, two sort of stalwarts of the Liverpool that 
but, but, that were failing, um, but looked good in a white suit in the FA Cup final. And they were moaning like buggery about um, about Klopp, the defense, Liverpool's defence when he first got there. And he was saying, what's he been doing in the summer? What's he been doing in the summer? You know, Liverpool can't defend. And, and, and Redknapp's coming in up over the top. He said, it's outrageous. You know, you've got it. I mean, it's basic stuff, you know. So they were right into Klopp because Liverpool were doing very well. And I just thought, you know, I mean, it was probably a fair comment to make at the time. Liverpool didn't start well in, in his reign and, and they were mediocre and he was working it all out and and they were making mistakes. But Shrewd you know, signings did it, didn't they? Amazing. Oh. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, this, he writes his own history and it's all known now. It's all out there, isn't it? But Klopp, yeah. And, and it, you know... You know, I've just got to see Pep out the door now, and I can start thinking, believing that Ratcliffe's going to pull something up. I, I, I think one of the interesting points you made there, you know, and the, the current um, feelings, you know, with state-owned clubs, as as we call it. But just to bring it back to what we were talking about, Real Madrid. I think. Do you not think they've got away with murder over the years? You know, oh, the yeah. number of times. You know, oh, and yeah. no one goes, "Oh, they're a state-owned club." But well, they were a state. Well. Well. <laughs> they, they, they are on club. Yeah, they sense. are, and oh, they no. are, and people did, especially if you're wearing a Barcelona shirt. Yeah, yeah. Um, they hundred percent not state, not just state owned, dictator owned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, if you take it right back, I mean, this is the, you know they're an they're a Spanish emblem, aren't they? But you look at the way that the um, I can't remember the detail. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to um, get myself into into a court battle here. But if you remember the shenanigans over the training ground. Yeah, that's that's the that that's Madrid, the yeah. In which uh, in which they w w were able to sell it for, um, you know, and get yield a load of dough. Bought it back for a bag of footballs, didn't they? I think. <laughs> it's the I don't know, but but you know the whole way that the, the Spanish the La Liga, and it's to the detriment of the Liga ultimately, because you had a you had a, a Scottish Premier League situation with Rangers and Celtic, yeah. but all the TV money that were accrued to. Um, to Real and and Barcelona just ultimately skewed the league, didn't it? And it skewed yeah. the competition to Europe. Yeah, and it's still doing it now. And, and this is the interesting thing because they've just they've just um, um, announced the signing of the, the one of the great left backs in the world from Bayern, haven't they? Um, Alfonso. Um, oh, have they? I'm yeah, Madrid have. Yeah, oh, you're okay. not seeing that. I'm not seeing that. Is Alfonso that today? Davis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. No. So, quite a so, so what? Yeah. So what they are still able to do, and they got they got um, Bellingham in the same way. They're still able to trade on this prestige uh, brand. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you can go to places like Getafe, which isn't like nothingness, um, uh, and, and another sort of tiny little ground. You know, it's not like the Premier League. It's just nothing like the Premier League, um, La, La Liga. But I mean, you know, it's, it's got its ground. You, you know, you still got a Valencia, Sevilla, and, and Madrid, and the big clubs like that, but. You know, you, you you've not got the kind of the, the same drama the Premier League offers up, where United can cough up a defeat at home to to Fulham, who haven't won since nineteen fifty away from home. You know, these things don't happen quite so much. But and, and so Madrid is still able to trade on the past name. But I wonder how long we'll be able to do that. And I think the end, of, I think the, the beginning of the end of that is probably coming because City in this purple patch, you don't know how many. Uh, Champions League they can clean up with. Um, you can certainly see them going for four or five easily, I would have thought. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I think it's really interesting because I think Madrid is, you know, your original point, if you, if, you know, the, the air crash doesn't happen, Madrid don't win five. How much does that affect their brand right at the start? So they're, they're, not the, they're not the European Cup. And then I I genuinely, even now, with, with any player at City, any player at Liverpool, any player anywhere, Real Madrid come in for you. As a career, as a footballer, to say you played for Real Madrid is still, I think, the one. Is, would you not well, agree? Well, yeah, no, I do. And I think, you know, it's like Ferrari, Hamilton going to Ferrari, you know, yeah. it was his boyhood team. Ferrari haven't won the title since 07. You know, how long ago is that? 17 years? Um, and they were lucky to win that. If You know, if 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 um, a dossier of, of information hadn't passed from Ferrari to McLaren, then Hamilton would have won that world championship in his first year. Yeah, um, it's still um, it's still one of the, the most you know I, I, you can't say that it was taken from him or he was pilfered, but I mean he was seventeen points clear with ten points for a win with two races to go, and you know he parked. He, he parked yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was worse than that. You know, McLaren kept him out for six laps on shot tires in China. And he ended up he ended up sliding sideways 
coming out of uh, in the pit lane into sand. Couldn't get out of it. So there's yeah. 10 points straight away. Yeah. And, and he had a mystery glitch. I know it's not football, but he had a mystery glitch um, it, on, on, on the back straight in, in Brazil in the final race of the season. And all the teams on the safest part of the track, the straightest part of the track, all filed past him. And then his engine fires up again and he's back in the race, but he can't win. <laughs> yeah. Ends up Kimi Raikkonen. Um, those, those are the sports brands, though, aren't they? You know, with, massive, well, yeah. Ferrari, yeah. Ferrari are F1 yeah. to a massive extent. And yeah. I think you can say the same of Real Madrid. Real Madrid are the European Cup Champions League to a huge extent. Five, five is a huge head start. Yeah, they got, absolutely. They're, they're on 14. City yeah. have got some work to do to catch that. Yeah, but there'll be another hundred years, so don't worry. And <laughs> Pep will still be there in hundred years because he's, he, he, you know, um, what a fun. I mean, the, the, I'll tell you what was that, that struck me about this weekend's coverage of um, of the stuff, the post Ratcliffe stuff. And and Pep said, you know, when he came here, you know, he always thought United, you know, in his characteristic language, always thought they would be there. <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's and he's making the right moves now in the infrastructure these changes that he's making with a yeah, he is. sports director and all that kind of stuff. But he said, You can't possibly, and United are an example of this, you can't possibly hope to to be successful in this period unless every element of your club is absolutely on it. From and they're all thinking in the same way, and in all the jobs dots are joined, from the CEO all the way down to the ball boy. And he said, once all those are in place and you're all speaking the same language, then it's just a question of work, 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 the whole way. And it seems to me that no one outworks City, no one outworks Pep. He, he lives and sleeps it, doesn't he? Um, yeah. No one runs harder than City. Um, and, and he's right. Well, I, and so, I, yeah. I, I was going to say, Kevin, it's when, you know, when we were rubbish and United had that great team, the, the one thing that I could cope with was, you know... We, which we team are you talking players. about, Pete? Which great team are you talking about here? Can you want to... A anyone from, you like. From, the anyone from you like. All the way to, all the way to yeah, 2013. All, all, all that time. Is all that, that time. Which United, rubbish City team? I, yeah. I, 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 I couldn't cope with, um, you know, United trying harder than us. Yeah. So yeah, City yeah. tried hard, United tried hard. United were going to win. You know, yeah. we we yeah. our team had to go out and and try hard. If you United were going to win, that's fine. But you couldn't try hard, and that's yeah. the trick. And yeah. That's yeah. Pep's trick, I think, and Klopp's trick. He hasn't, yeah. you know, yeah. won yeah. all those trophies. He hasn't yeah. trying hard. No one's walking around the pitch at, no. on, at Liverpool or at City. That's the no. trick. No, no. Whereas, no I, I genuinely think I could. I I probably run more now than Fernandez runs. Don't <laughs> you know, I will like walk around the centre circle. Well, a little you know what, Fernandez. Fernandez, is, that's a coaching issue because that indiscipline is, is permitted, you know, yeah. on the altar that, that exactly. he's a great player. Well, you're not a great player if you're not running about, nope. mate. You know, sorry. Well, I think we we probably all read several Guardiola books, but I, I remember one particular passage where he describes his early days as a coach and going to Johan Cruyff for advice on if there's a player who may be the best player at the club, but his attitude doesn't fit and causes problems. And Cruyff said to him, just get rid of him. Just get yeah. rid of him. Getting rid of him will, will show your position and how committed you are and also what attitude is required. And yes, you might get a little bit of short-term pain, but in the long term, it will do you better. And I felt that for the last three or four years, United have had a bunch of players yeah. who... Would all have fallen into that category. Yeah, the one who's, yeah. only one is sitting there right now, I feel, which is Fernandez. Yeah, but, but yeah. maybe a couple of others who could go for other reasons. But I think Fernandez is in that position as best player. Yeah. But actually, I think he's a massive issue. Yeah. 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 Well, it's why, it's why Pep and Zlatan send Christmas cards to each other, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, he didn't last long with Pep, did he? Zlatan. Um, oh. There's only one but winner you, there, you know. But yeah, you think about um, you think about that. But the way that Fergie, you know, who is like this iron fist, tolerated um, petulance from Eric. Cantona more than petulance from Cantona. I mean, he bent yeah. over backwards, and he and he bent over backwards to keep Ronaldo for an extra year when Ronaldo was desperate to go to Madrid. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Rooney as well. He begged Rooney to stay when Rooney said he was off. You know, so they'll make they'll make adjustments for the player, and I think that's what tends to happen. 
Um, and that's what's happening at United because, you know, I, I, I accept all the criticisms that you that you make about um, Finanche, as they call him in Portugal, but mm. uh, were we not to have him? I mean, the bloke never gets injured. I mean, the bloke's a war horse. Um, but I just think he needs discipline. And, and you know, and for under, you know, under Solskjaer, him and Rashford played their best football of their careers um, yep. until he flogged them to death. Um, and he, he, you know, and, and and maybe that maybe that indulgence was ultimately his ruin. But it's a problem United have to solve one way or another. What if the Munich air crash had never happened? What if Michael Owen had stayed fit? What if Ajax never sold? These are just some of the things discussed in a brand new book, moments that could have changed football forever. Every what if moment in the book has been chosen to spark debate. Buy your copy now online at Amazon or Waterstones. Just to bring it back to where we started off, I, I'm, I am fascinated by the pushcast to yeah. United sort of side Amazing. of life. So we've, yeah. we've done, you know, the crash doesn't happen. United challenged Real Madrid, but that is a hell of a swing if Puskas turns up at United. How do you think he'd have slotted in with that team? Because they didn't have there wasn't a superstar name they sort of they were growing into superstars they've got they've got Duncan Edwards we've got Bobby Duncan yeah. was probably a superstar Bobby wasn't Eddie Coleman wasn't all those players were not it superstars Pushkas yeah. Pushkas was yeah you yeah. drop Pushkas in that team it's like Eric in it almost like a few years yeah. you know a few yeah. decades yeah. later Pete I think you work it out don't you you know I mean you know you look at Pep's team at City and you think, well, they make a signing. You think, well, they're going to play him. I mean, they had Bernardo, couldn't get a game for half a season at City, could he? He was on no, the bench. Right. Yeah. My God. I mean, phew. so you, the, the great, I mean, I think Busby would have worked it out. I think he'd have worked it out. Um, play off Tommy Taylor just behind him. That's what <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, a classic number 10, isn't he? You know, yeah. Um, with um, with Butane in his boots, as, as was said of Bobby, you know, I think he'd have, have just built your team around him as Madrid did, you know. Um, but I was—I I mean, I'd never heard this story. I mean, I couldn't believe it. So there I am. I think we're uh, we're in. I'm the I'm the covering Formula One at this time, mostly for the Daily Mirror, and, and it's the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of of England's greatest horror story. You know, when uh, when, yeah. when 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 the James was forever. When the mother country, who never gets beat, you know, they play host in a pea super in November '53. Um, I think it was November, wasn't it? October or November. So. Um, to the great uh, Magyar, Magyars, um, and this was fifty. When we yeah, fifty uh, three. So this is this was this team was just coming together, um, and they obviously Pan Sistan and 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 Pan Tom Finney at, at, at Wembley, and then seven months later, I think it was eight, the following April, they go to Budapest for the return fixture, and this is the, the they just built a new. Uh, post-war stadium in Budapest and it became the Nep Stadium. I think it's now named after Pushkas. And and it was the first game anybody that, that they played. So they were it was the debut and they were uh, the champagne moment. And I think they smashed seven past England that day. Um and, and Grosic uh, uh played in goal that day. And when I went in 03 uh, to cover the uh, Hungarian Grand Prix um there were only three players from that great Hungarian golden team left. One of whom was Pushkas, who was hospitalised, I think, with Alzheimer's, really struggling near the end. Grosic, who was healthy, uh, the goalkeeper, who I met, and um, Buzanski, the left back. And um, it was Grosic who um, invited me, who, who, who told me the story about Pushkas. And I, I was just amazed at this, that the, the idea that he could have, he was anywhere near Manchester United. And he said, no, he, were, he was, basically, they were all they were all on the run from um this was okay. around all on the run i love that yeah all basically on the run from um because they played for um what was the what's the, the not Honda was it it's Honvad Honvad was it Honvad yeah. yeah it was Honvad yeah it was the army team basically yeah um, yeah in Budapest and um uh, which was obviously a communist state at that point and they had to you know they they, 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 were, they wanted to get out of it push just wanted out you know he wanted out he wanted freedom as it were um, so he was like floating around Europe with no, without a home, as, but he, he was promised to Madrid. I don't know the, the politics or the diplomacy that got him to Madrid, but at this point he hasn't joined Madrid. So he's um, he's doing a tour of Europe, if you like, and um, he, he, he spent a week 
uh, to, I think it was a week to 10 days, uh, training uh, with Manchester United. Um, and um, and, and Grosic was telling me this. I said, are you sure about this? Oh, of course I'm sure. And I said, well, you know, what, what was he like? He said he absolutely loved it. And United w w w wanted to buy him, but he was promised to Madrid. And so there was never any any prospect of him joining Old Trafford. But, um, no bidding it was. Like, it almost feels like a fairy story now because, you know, it was never talked about, was it? You know, Charlton never mentioned no. it. So I'm aware. No. Um, but, I'm but just was, imagining anything within 20 yards with... Well, 25 yards with Pushkas and Charlton on the pitch. I, I know to to degree there is a little bit of that when Pushkas and De Stefano on the pitch, because yeah. what the lack of footage there there that's out there, but what footage there is, they do both seem to be quite prolific from distance. And Pushkas's shot power yeah. is the stuff of legends. Yeah, with his left foot, whereas Bobby's sh shooting prowess off of both feet. Yeah, yeah. It's I think predominantly left, Pete. But um, but I agree. You know, I mean, he, he could he could bash it with his right as well. Um, he, I mean, yeah. I mean, can, can you imagine? And then again, that feeds in. You know, then if he's at Old Trafford, he doesn't go to um, he doesn't tie up with Di Stefano. Um, yeah. And, and the babes, the babes get a chance to mature with Pushkas at the heart of that team. You know, wow. Think well, on. Well, might be even worse for City now, Pete. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had a great side in 1950. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, City World. We forget. We forget that before the the legend of Manchester United was born with these European things and the babes. You know, City were every bit as prominent in Manchester as United were. You know. Um, oh yeah. Uh, well, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It, well, it's, it was. It, you know, it was a different era, and you get that thing. You know, a lot of a, a lot of the lads. Dads who did go to the football did go to Old Trafford one week and Main Road the next. They absolutely did. You know, of course, yeah. that's made up, but they did. And if you dig further back into it, you know, when when it, you, you're emerging from Newton Heath, you know, City emerged. City grew as a club, a big club, quicker than United in those early part of the yeah. 20th century. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really the, the historian Gary James does a really good um, football historian. Uh, you know, he's City's historian, but he, he's a football historian. And it, it was City's Cup win in 1904 that tipped Manchester into a football city. They were a rugby city up to that. Yeah, yeah. And they, they brought the FA Cup back and the crowds came out and it was like, right, you know, that was a deciding yeah. deciding moment. Yeah. But you, you, with me, you know, because Pete's a Liverpool fan, the same when I worked on the history of Liverpool and Everton, they, they used to produce one programme. So you got Liverpool, you know, if Liverpool at home, the front of it was, like, it started off with Liverpool, but it had the Everton away uh, Teams, you know, who everyone were playing at the back. Yeah, you no, know, yeah. there was only one program in Liverpool, I think, throughout the fifties, which is yeah. like, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it is it's a different game. game. Football was viewed in a different way. And before Shankly, you know, I mean, another what if moment. I'm sure you just that, that, that is is available for discussion. But you know, Shankly hadn't turned up when he did. But you know, when Liverpool had spent what was it, five, six seasons in Division Two, five seasons yeah. in the second tier. Shankly turned up, and two seasons later, they're um, they're back in the first division. But Everton with the yeah. top, with the with the with the daddy team in Liverpool, right? Yeah. Well, I think one of the one of the points of the book and the podcast is to remind people of football history, yeah, and the elements of it that are technically, tactically, and those sliding doors parts that are very relevant even now. Yeah, and people. We, we may not be doing this in 30, 40 years' time, but people will still be able to write the same sort of scripts, the same sort of tales yeah, of modern of football. But it's worth remembering for people who see Everton as a club that are maybe slightly underachieving and happy to finish in mid-table, they have, as at this moment in time, just as many league titles as Manchester City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they, still, they, they're, they, they're tied up for titles, and yeah. I mean, gee, Sunderland, Sunderland have got as many titles as Chelsea. Yeah, and yeah. people, I mean, these are, these things are forgotten. Yeah, well, so, yeah, Sunderland. I mean, what were the Bank of England team? They were called cool ones. Yeah, and yeah, the other team, the other team that deserves a mention of this, the the the, um, the European pioneers in the fifties, Wolverhampton Wanderers, of course. Yeah, exactly. When, yeah, when I played. 
when I was at school, our school kit was the Wolves kit. And I still yeah. get nostalgic when I see that gold top. Yeah, yeah. Black shorts and, then, and gold top. That's really bad. Our, our school team, my primary school team colours were Wolves. And I, I, it was the only other kit I had that wasn't a city kit when I was growing up because I yeah. just loved it. You know, oh, amazing. And I, I, one, one of the interesting points we do, um, there's a chapter in the book called What If the Champions League Was For Champions uh, Only? And yeah. that season when the crash happens, Wolves have got quite a big lead on United. Yeah. So you're saying, would United have actually got in the European <laughs> Cup? Because there's only yeah. one place, if you yeah. remember. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. following year, you know, it yeah. would have been, you know, Wolves go in and, and that. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, you think, well, United, if they hadn't crashed, they would have won it the year after and, and on we go, you know. So yeah. It, yeah. it's quite interesting. The, that rivalry with Wolves was massive at the time, yeah. wasn't yeah. it, with, yeah. with United? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I kind of, I sorry, Pete. Go on. I was going to say, well, Wolves in in '54 played Honvard. Yeah, because that they were the, these are the teams who are pioneering yeah, right. yeah. European tours. And oh well, yeah, that was that was part of the FA when when England got thumped six three. The FA wanted to show that English football was still the best, so they yeah. they, they, they organised that yeah, game. The champions our yeah, champions yeah. versus their champions, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. But and, it was and Wolves were victorious. Yeah, yeah, they watered the pitch. Apparently, <laughs> that was true. They watered the pitch. Did they? Um, yeah, but I mean, yeah, f fabulous, fabulous. Uh, I mean, and grown out of a, 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 an industrial metropolis, Wolverhampton, hugely important in nineteenth century, um, driving powerhouse of, of British industry. Um, and yeah, and the football clubs grew up out of that kind of environment, didn't they? Manchester. But the Midlands was dominant uh, for a long yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Absolutely. and the northeast. Yeah. And the, and then slight shift towards the northwest. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it um, followed the football success followed industry. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's the basis of uh, uh, soconomics, isn't it? Is it right? The, uh, you know, when he he he, he said up to Chelsea that, that no capitals had won the Champions League. It's all like the big industrial cities had won. Yeah. What's it? Uh, yeah, that uh, might uh, hold. That might hold for us. Yeah. Well, is, yeah. is the the best hope for clubs who are going up against massive, massive financial institutions or nations? Is the best hope the Babes model? And we've just very pressured the day after we've seen Liverpool call on youthful resources to surprise everybody, as certainly as the game went on, to hold off an expensively assembled Chelsea team with a number of youth players. It brings to mind the Cruyff quote, Cruyff getting in every time it seems, but I've never seen a bag of money score a goal. Yeah. Um, is that rather than trying to outspend the um, people who it's impossible to outspend is the best chance for someone like Manchester United with their proud history with their youth set up actually really to go down that route well I think you know Pig United have, I think no no club in, in, in the history of football has produced or has played, selected more team, more players from the youth team uh, consecutively through the years. United's got, I can't remember when he goes back to, but he goes back to something silly, doesn't it? Um, it's a massive, massive yeah. amount of time, yeah. yeah. And, you know, United haven't failed because they've not had money to spend. They've, they've spent, in this period, the current squads, they've spent more, believe it or not, they've spent more than Chelsea and City up to mm -hmm. 2023. And that didn't, that didn't include last summer's madness uh, where we spent 200 million. Uh, again, um, uh, on three players was it 200 million? I'm get, getting on for that, wasn't it? Um, a lot. Cool. um, yeah, um, so you know, United haven't failed because they haven't spent money, they spent over a billion, a billion, um, euros 1.19, um, in this, in this current phase of big spends, uh, more than City, I think they were second, and, and Chelsea were third, or Chelsea might be second. I mean, there's not a lot in it, they've all, they're all spent a bill, but you know. So the answer comes down to coaching, Pete. And, and, and the two best teams in this period are Liverpool and City. And hey-ho, why? Because they've got the best coaches and the best management structures, infrastructure as clubs around them. Whatever you say about um, about the money ballers at Liverpool, they know the game. 
They, yeah. they, you know, they don't. I mean, they, they, they don't know football, but they've, 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 they've just followed through on a rationale that's placed in key positions people who know what they're doing. And City is, is you know, amazing again, isn't it? Um, yeah. I think it's quite an interesting point Pete makes uh, about the, the youth team structure. And I think people are cottoning on to the way City do it. If you look at Chelsea like five, six years ago, they've got about four teams with the players out on loan. Yeah. What City do is they buy people. They don't send them on, out on loan. They sell them with a buyback clause. Yeah. They make more money out of that academy. They make like 40, 50 million every yeah. year and this is, out of the this academy. Is, and this is important when it comes to um, profitability, yeah, profitability and sustainability rules. This new classification that's replaced FFP, and, and this is why United are struggling because they buy big, pay massive wages, and, and can't get rid of them. You know? Yeah, there's a, well, there's, a, there's a, one of my best mates who's a big United fan. He rattles on about how cheaply United sell the plates, it's like Jimmy Garner to Everton. Isn't it? Oh God, yeah, I mean you know. loads of it. And this is this is I think this is the the kind of the impetus toward um, in the summer that could easily see. Um, Greenwood. Uh, I mean, this, there's a, a huge political um, yeah. movement around, around, the, and quite rightly so, around the Greenwood. But Ramsh, you know, I mean, and they're both academy products. Um, Greenwood, you know, I think he'll go for a few quid because he's a good player. Um, and, you know, and, but Rash has got a massive wage too. So you've got a massive wage, and you've got academy players, and they go for big dough. Then the FFP, that's FFP gold, isn't it? You know, I. I can't see Marcus staying. I just no. can't. You just look at his body language. Oh. And and the difference between his body language when he does play for England. He, he's oh, not yeah. been great for England, but his body language is chalk and cheese when he plays for United, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Although it has got better since Radcliffe arrived. But, you know, you saw the way that Ross Barkley walked around him at, 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 at Luton. Yeah. Um, and that went viral, that, didn't it? You know, and, and you yeah. Know, what a shame. I mean, you, you could argue that, that that his contribution to English football, there hasn't been a greater one, given the U-turn that he forced on the British state over the education, oh, absolutely. Over, over the feeding absolutely. of school children during COVID. You know, he got that muttonhead Boris to turn around and say, you know, Mia Culpa, yes, of course, we'll feed children. Um, I don't know that any football has ever achieved anything like that. So well done, Marcus, for that. And, and I, he'll always be a hero for that. But I yeah, fear that he just just, just that line, Kev. Of course, we'll feed children. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is, I mean, this is a politics show, but yeah. he needed <laughs> to put a great great football to, to make him see the line. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we should all applaud right. Rashi for that. And I think that's that. You know, when when people are giving him saying he doesn't care or it's you know, we had this discussion. I had this discussion at weekend with a, 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 this you know United fan who's fed up with Rashford. But I'm just saying, look, just you know, he's beyond criticism for me, Rashford. You know, yeah. I, I think he's had an appalling season, but I think he's got, you know, who knows what these players suffer behind the scenes. You know, he's been, he's splitting up with his girlfriend last summer and then he's not splitting up. I mean, I split up with a girl many, many years before I met my wife and I, I tease her about this, but, you know, and I was like, I was smashed for about six months. Um, and if he's suffering yeah, he's in his life, I, do, I wouldn't have been playing football, you know. Um, <laughs> oh, so, you know best. Hands, hands off Rashford, you know. Yeah. I always well, no. remember... Um, when Liverpool sold John Arisa and he got a lot of criticism for having had a terrible season. That year, he had been, he'd gone bankrupt. He'd been bankrupted and was having massive issues off the pitch and the fans are giving him stick. Yeah, yeah. You've got to think about what these guys are doing. Yeah. yeah. In the, What's happening in real life to them because yeah, they have absolutely. lives... They have yeah. lives too, and yeah. no surprise he wasn't at his best in yeah, a, during yeah, a time absolutely. like that. Yeah. And he was he was one who I thought was sold too soon. But you know, it, it's that mm. thing we fans think they have a right to criticize. Okay, maybe maybe, but to call for a player to be gone, players are allowed. Well, players are allowed a poor season. Yeah. You look at someone. Drogba's a great example. You look at his goal scoring record. He had two, two twenty plus goal seasons. He had a few single figure Premier League seasons as well, and no one is criticising that. Yeah, no, I think you know we, we're guilty of objectifying footballers. You know the commodities, aren't they? The bought and sold. Yeah. It, you know they don't have lives. They don't have feelings, and and they're not allowed to be rubbish. <laughs> you know, um, you know, and we're a very, very. Um, 
unsympathetic audience, I think, at times. Um, yeah, there you go. Listen, can we? It, it's been brilliant, but I can't let you go without having 10 minutes or five minutes or whatever on the little snippet that you gave us. Uh, what if Ron, uh, Barcelona hadn't nicked I'm Ronald Dino? 203. I mean, come on. He was, at, he, was on, he was on his way to United, wasn't he? We all knew that, you know. He was, he was, yeah. he was, he was, he was, he was hidden away up in um, in Holland, you know, as all the Brazilians were coming through the the, the Dutch East Indies, weren't they? Um, so yeah, he finds he finds his way. Um, um, he's playing in Holland, and you know the deal was done. And I went off to Budapest, thinking, you know, to do my big background on Grosic and and push us to United um, in my last year at the Daily Mirror, and. Um, and, and, and I was really excited, you know, and I came back, you know, I came back from that trip and um, he's, he's signed for Barcelona, you know, his brother had nicked him. And um, I, look, I can't blame him for joining Barca. And this it's all about, isn't it, this um, uh, this kind of mystique that, that the clubs that Barcelona, that still, they cling on to. Less, I mean, Barcelona's is massively eroded now and they, they seem to be in a bigger spot. Yeah, they, they are struggling. Um, you know, they, 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 their Solskjaer, Xavi, is just... You know, he's, 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 he's out in the summer, isn't he? You know, he can't carry yeah. on. So, you know, but um, the, the big, the mystique that still, that, that, well, that persuades someone like Frankie de Jong that Barcelona's still the option and not United. I mean, he's just absolutely, well, he might be right now. <laughs> but he's not going to be right when, he's not going to be right now under Ratcliffe because Ratcliffe looks like he's, well, he doesn't, he's not messing about that bloke, is he? Um, Frankie would be great in the city midfield. I'm just going to leave. That he would there. be. He would be. Yeah. Um, but you don't absolutely you know, be spot on. He, he would be. Um, but yeah, I mean, City don't. I mean, it's like uh, Liverpool. They don't. I mean, Liverpool. Crikey, you know. You look at that. I was looking at that. You know, they're supposed to have ten players missing, but you still see they can they can feel Diaz and McAllister. I mean, McAllister from. I mean, what a, what a purchase for the same as Jet Mason Mount. Less than Mason. The United played for Mason Mount. He's barely kicked yeah. a ball. Yeah. Um, yeah, you so forget, long, you forget that you forget Mason Mount's there. No, no, you do, but we, you know, <laughs> some of us don't. But, you know, we, you know, well, you know, he was yeah, it, it's, it, 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 in the summer, you know, big move to United, yeah, and and it's like who's getting in the England midfield? Is it Foden or Mount? You well, know, is the big the, when, they, when he was at his Chelsea stroke peak, Foden couldn't get in ahead of him. So, uh, get ahead of man for Southgate. Southgate preferred yeah. man because he liked because he could trust him. Industry, you know, all that old English yep. um, trait for for dependability over flair. I mean, he's leaving out Hoddle, like flair man. Right. Like yeah. flair. But he's never. I mean, he was clear at seventeen that Foden was a genius. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think with Gareth, with uh, there was that, um, and I think it was one with Greenwood. Didn't they both get sent home from? Yeah, yeah. They were in, was it in Finland or? or yeah, something? and it, it, I think it took Gareth a long time for him to forgive Phil for that. I do. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think Phil might have been a father at that point. <laughs> He's been married since he was 14, hasn't he? For, uh, <laughs> well, his but, lad's got more Twitter followers, more social media followers than, you know. But can, can, you, can you imagine uh, a, a, a Ronaldinho inspired Manchester United? Is there ever a footballer more fitted for, for United? Oh, that's, than that was going to be my point. Yeah. He, yeah. He's not beyond Eric, isn't he? If, well, if he goes, he's you know, more, yeah, I mean. I think Eric was, yeah. I mean, I think he would have had problems because he'd have been in the nightclub and he'd been, he'd have been eating. George. He'd have been, eating. It'd have been George too, wouldn't it? It'd have been George too, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but it'd have been, it'd have been, uh, you know, volcanic. Um, and there was a period, wasn't there, when um, remember that when, game when Barcelona won at the Bernabeu and he scored, and they Solo were just, goal, yeah, just unplayable. Um, I always remember period. that one at Chelsea. That that goal he scored at Chelsea, there was yeah. more, more, you know, that they call it the futsal finish, you know, but it was like, whoa, yeah. what's he just done? You know, I you mean, could hear that gasp. You always know it's a great goal when you hear, you don't hear a cheer first, you hear a, it's like, goes like a library for a split second, but yeah, it's like what for just seen. Oh. And we and in this kind of post, in this, in the messy period that obliterated everything that came before it at Barcelona. You forgot. You forget how good Ronaldinho was. Um, I mean, I think he came into the team at the same time, didn't he? Uh, just at the end of Ronaldinho's career, Messi slipped in at the same. Yeah, time. towards the, the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just I'm just having a little click around and checking the United squad. And 2003, 
would have been about the time for Ronaldinho. Um, it does look like they managed to get Eric Jemba Jemba instead. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. yeah. They, also, they also, that summer, parted company with Beckham and Veron. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But they brought in someone called Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah. Now, yeah. Cristiano, I suppose, he was very young. I, I'm going to assume that the presence of Ronaldinho would have made little difference re in reality because Cristiano wasn't a bona fide hey, superstar hey, hey. at the time. You don't think, you don't think Rooney, Ronald, Ronaldo and Ronaldinho could, couldn't have played in the same team? No, I think they could have done. That's what I'm saying. I think they could have done. And I, So often we think about the knock-ons and a player coming in would it have stopped someone else from flourishing? Yeah. But in this in this case, I don't think that would have been Ronaldinho being there wouldn't have stopped Cristiano because yeah, yeah. no, I take Cristiano your point. Is still establishing yeah. himself. A what if it's not as powerful a what if moment yeah. when you consider what they achieved with Rooney and Ren yeah. Pete Rooney and Pete Ronaldo. But don't forget, I mean, Rooney came after they sold Beckham, didn't they? They did all the money, and that that was my big advocacy at the time. I said, look, let. You know, and Beckham went, just do all your money on Rooney. And they did, thank God, you know. Um, but um, yeah, what was that? United kind of still had that pull then, though, didn't they, Kev? That United still had that pull to go, who's your best player, Rooney? Yeah, we love him. Well, yeah, they were the, Madrid of, the Madrid of, of England, weren't they? You know, and, and and you have to say now that, that they've lost that power here because of the landscape yeah. change. And other people, like Chelsea came along in 04 and then City five years later, who could pay just as much as they can. Now we've got Newcastle doing the same, you know, but but what, one of the yeah. things, you know, perhaps we're closing here, one of the things that you have to say is working in this regard to 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 to, to bring the, 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 the um, primacy of coaching back to the centre of it is that the um, FFP, you know, it's, it's cutting this. I mean, this is going, going to go to the heart of the, the City issue that's being dealt with by the Premier League and the 115 charges. What City were able to do back then is what Newcastle can't do now, and yeah. just just make a just find a way of spending money that was beyond the regulations. This is the allegation City deny it, um, and this will be decided. But it's certainly the scrutiny now on clubs is so great that it's just. I mean, Newcastle can't buy their way to yeah. where they would be able to. So well, was, for the, the thing that you know we can argue forever about the rights and wrongs of it, but it, to me, it just feels totally wrong that Manchester United were had to bring in last season Burnley's centre forward on loan. You thought, yeah, I thought you'd be name? laughing at that. I mean he was yeah I mean, like, called, what is going on? That, I mean that's just nonsense, isn't it? It was it was the funniest thing because I mean he I love the fact that he was always in there having a go, you know, but he was just so incapable of fulfilling that Sure, you know, and he, he scored. Well, he, did. he looked like he'd won a competition, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah. comedy. I mean, but this kind of summed up the kind of the, the madness. But it, when we've not just him, you know, we've you know, about a few. I mean, we've just bought in a host of like, I mean, you could just say Casemiro and Varana did, uh, this now, but we had uh, we had a Gallo in the team, don't forget. Um, we had Ibra, who was who, who, best years were behind him. Um, and we had the great Uruguayan whose name escapes me, he was um, Cavani. Yeah, Cavani scored a few, but this was less like nuts, wasn't it? You know, what were they doing? Bringing well, there was no plan, was they? they there was no, no, no plan, plan. yeah, no, there's no plan. Yeah. I think the no plan thing's relevant because a very similar signing that you'd have thought, how on earth has that happened? Barcelona, they brought in Luke de Jong, yeah, up to play up front for them, very, very similar. And yeah. I think it does tie into this. Yeah, we're yeah. scrabbling it out a bit, and we yeah. need, yeah. you know, we, yeah. we need to find something. No problem. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. You know, he's um, bang average. He is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. United really? swerved one there. Um, anyway, there we are. What? Do you think? So finally, I'll just ask you. I think Jim's going to do it. Yeah, I do. Good. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Only because if you look, if this bloke's ruthless. I mean, just just think about this. He's a he's a graduate of um, of chemical engineering, and his first fifteen years he spent post graduate post graduate in industry, working for I think it was BP Shell and, and another company I think. Um, so you know he's working now as a wage labourer. It might have been you know earned a few quid because he's got a degree and everything else, and he's an engineer etc. He knows a bit about industrial chemistry, but then he worked went he went to work for a, an, an, an investment bank 
that's when he made his money. This is when Jim Radcliffe becomes a, a wheeler, a trader, a wheeler dealer, and he builds his own business. He, he, there's a management buyout of an old part of the industry that I think it was BP had just got rid of, and he went and bought it for 40 mil, sold it five years later for 90 mil, and now he's moving. This bloke's not messing about. And Ineos is like, I mean, they're ferocious out there in the bit. I mean, he's built all the way up. Um, there are massive players in, in petrochemicals. He's Britain's richest man. He's ruthless. He's, he's ruthless. The idea that he's, and, and also, that, don't, he's not coming in here as a kind of evangelistic fan. You know, I, I've got a load of money I can buy. Oh, you know, okay. a bit of fun here. He's thinking like the Glazers are, that we're only at the start of this explosion of football into the entertainment space. Yeah. They're looking at all sorts, United's fan base and how they make money out of all that. Yep. And, and Ratcliffe's in it for that too. You know, he's already yeah. trying to get the government to build a new ground, right? So, you know, he, he's going to try everything, but he, but, he, but he knows how business works and he knows how operations cling together. And he's already spotted the failings at United straight away. Yep. And he's, and he's taken, he's taken the, the steps to move them forward. And these yeah, are yes. three, three good off, off, three really good off the pitch signings. And Pep has already remarked that without that, nothing works. You know, yeah, even Pep, Pep at United would be a failure. He might get, he might, he might be a bit better, but you know. So I right. think, yeah, you are, to answer your question, I, I, I'm optimistic that we're, 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 we're on the way across, back. Yeah, but I, I don't know that that that, Pep, that Ten Hag's got an earthly, um, given the evidence of what we've already seen. Um, for, think, for added optimism, that background has some. Ringings of similarity to one John W. Henry. <laughs> yeah. They know how so, to make money. They know how to, they know how to make a business tick. They know what works. Yeah. And, and he's already saying, look, you know, we're not going to pay Casimir. We're not going to buy this bloke for 30 years old and give him 300 grand a week. Are you mad? No. Yeah. They're, we'll they're give them, I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? When, when, you, when, when players move from, let's say, Newcastle, and you can see how, how little um, Gimoresh earns at Newcastle. I mean, it's, just, it, it's not a big sum. Um, this is the start. City, City. You know, I think only I think KDB is the the most the best played player in the Premier League, and something like four hundred grand. But I mean, he wasn't that to start with. No. Um, and you can see when, when how much Mane earned at uh, Sadio Mane earned at Liverpool. It wasn't a massive sum, was it? No. That's why Salah, got, Salah yeah. when he came in, yeah, he was far. Well, they they broke all of their their um, wage structure to to retain him. Yeah. yeah, to retain him, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. initially nowhere near it. Yeah, so I think he's trying to drive that stuff down and he's just he's just going to have a sensible approach. And I think with the right people in charge to identify the right, you know, the right culture, to put the right culture in place, the culture that's at Anfield, the culture that's at, um, at the Etihad. And, it, but, you know, the idea of a new stadium, I think, is just the most apposite thing because it's like a, here we go, fresh start, big yeah. statement again. And it puts United right back where they, they think they ought to be in this legacy institution, yeah. leading and, and brand best in class, all that stuff, which City have nicked, Liverpool have clawed back. Um, and Chelsea, you yeah. know, yeah, yeah, I don't know what Chelsea are doing. Does anybody know what Chelsea are doing? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh, dear. And on that bombshell, Kev, yeah. it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on it. I think it's the first time in the podcast We've oh, had well. and slid into the gravel, sand gravel pit uh, mentioned, but it's, bit of, it's bit of been really, for you. yeah, bit yeah. Of we, we touched every, every base there. It's been an absolute yeah. pleasure, and thank you very much. A rainbow program. Thank you for um, for inviting me. Lovely to to um, have this discussion. What a yeah. game! What a great game! Yeah. We're all friends. We're, still, you're the enemy. <laughs> you are the enemy, but we're still friends, which is yeah. as it should be. Cheers, Kev. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, what if Brian Clough had managed England? What if Ronaldo and Messi had played together? What if Pep Guardiola managed in League 2? These are just some of the things discussed in a brand new book, Moments That Could Have Changed Football Forever. Every football fan has a what-if moment that they know would have brought their team glory if things had turned out differently. Every what-if moment in the book has been chosen to spark debate amongst football fans. Buy your copy now online at Amazon or Waterstones and let us know what's your favourite what-if moment in football history.